Okay, Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. This is lesson 10 in the series, keeping love alive, finding it when you lose it. One of the main reasons that men avoid commitment of marriage is their fear of boredom. It's not the fear of commitment, it's the fear of boredom. Yes, it's great now, but in a few years I'll get bored of this or I'll get bored with you, so why bother? I mean, that's pretty you know, basic man talk. It's no wonder that more and more couples simply live together without marriage since they see one out of two marriages around them and in divorce. That's pretty discouraging. You know, you're getting married and you're watching you know, your friend's that wedding that you went to you know, three years ago, he's now getting divorced. A lot of people think that by not marrying, they're somehow keeping the spark alive in their relationship, or at the very least, they're making it easier if they eventually break up, no messy, expensive divorce. I've heard that argument over and over again. Oh, why, why would we get married? You know, we want to keep the spark going. The truth is that all relationships, married or not, go through phases. You know, fresh excitement, discovery, disappointment, sadness, renewal. This is the norm for everybody. Boredom, boredom is normal. Boredom is just normal. It, I mean, it doesn't have to be all boredom, but periods of boredom, you know, we're human, we're sinners. Now the difference for married couples is that from the beginning they have promised with God or the law of the state as witness that when these times would come, they would persevere in their relationship. This is the main difference between married couples and couples who simply live together. Not love for one another. When I confront a couple that's just living together and not married and they're insulted that I would think less of their relationship, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, hey, I'm not saying you don't love her and you don't love him, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is the level of commitment that you're at is not the highest level of commitment the highest level of commitment you can make to one another is to be married. So in my lesson today, I want to talk about those times that occur in every marriage when our love for the other begins to falter or get a little cool. After a while, many couples experience boredom and they think they're kind of out of love, if you wish. So as the title suggests, we can keep love alive. It is possible to find it again after we think that it's, uh, that it's God. Now, most of the time when people talk about the experience of love, what they're talking about is a feeling. You know, that warm, happy, content, excited feeling we experience when in contact with our partner. With time, some people lose that feeling and they don't know how to get that thing back. And people have strange ways of trying to rekindle the flame of their romance. Uh, they'll threaten their partner. If you don't make me feel love, I'll leave you. Uh, I don't know where the motivation is there, but I've seen that happen. Or they'll make their partner jealous. Yeah, that'll, that'll get the spark back. I'll make my partner jealous. Or they'll try different approaches to sex. Or they'll pout to see if the other will give them what they want. You know, there's all kinds of approaches. What many people don't understand is that the feeling of love is not created by demands. It's not even created by sex or manipulation. The feeling of love that a person has is largely created and maintained through the use, listen now, through the use of loving communication. You want to get the spark back? You want to start the spark? You want to fan the flame? Loving communication is the way to go. The thing that produced love within us in the first place was the communication of love by our partner. When our love weakens or diminishes, then the first place to look for a solution is in the area of communication. We look everywhere else except in the area, you know, we think, oh, I got to hit the gym or oh, I got a, a new wardrobe or whatever. And yeah, those things might be helpful. But loving communication is the key to maintaining romance, maintaining true love in a relationship. 
You see, this thing, this feeling of love is moved from one person to another through the process of communication. Not always, but in many cases, the love problem is really a communication problem. In my counseling as a minister, I have seen people who have the capacity to love, they want to love, they need to love, but they don't communicate well, and for this reason, they have problems with love. I sincerely believe that in most marriages, the best way to increase love or to find it when it's gone is to find better ways to communicate with one another about the topic of love. And that brings me to the language of love. What holds a marriage together is love. The tool that transfers love and builds it and maintains it is communication. A couple of quotes. Communication is to love what blood is to life. A proverb, better an open rebuke than love that is concealed. You know, better we're fighting with each other and grappling with each other than you know, no contact, no, nothing, nothing said. At least you care. If you're struggling back and forth with each other, at least you, know, you care enough. The writer of Proverbs, Solomon, is saying that arguing and disagreement is better than no communication at all. In other words, uncommunicated love is like no love. Now when I say communication is the language of love, I'm not talking simply about verbal communication. In our culture uh, you know, of audio and visual communication, we put a lot of emphasis on oral communication, visual communication. We think that if it's not said verbally so we can hear it, then for some reason or other, it hasn't been properly communicated. In his book, The Language of Love, Gary Smalley says the following, we need to understand that the language of love can be communicated in many ways not just with words. So the language of love, what are the different languages? Well, words, of course, expressions of appreciation, loyalty, affection, love, admiration, attraction. You know, we use words of love. So of course, the language of love, words, uh, absolutely. But not just words, gifts, tokens of love, and appreciation, things you buy, things you make. I always appreciate my wife, uh, she makes cards. I've kept cards, you know, guys don't usually keep cards, but I've kept some of the cards that Lisa's made, you know, uh, because I appreciate the time that she's put into it, and sometimes the messages are from the heart. Uh, service or actions, actions to please and comfort the other person, the home, the family, the care of the other person's uh, possessions. Service, that's a language of love. Time, giving attention, giving quantity as well as quality time. Listening, really listening, watching, observing. Kids are like that, right? Watch me, daddy, watch me, mommy, right? Well, what are they saying, actually? They're saying, love me, mommy, love me, daddy. That's what they're saying. Sometimes it's, it's your wife that's saying that to you. Watch me, pay attention to me, or vice versa. And then of course, physical affection, touching, holding, sexual intimacy. This is a language of love too. Now psychologists tell us that one of these languages is our primary language for love. One of these is the hot button that satisfies our need to know that we are loved. Usually when love dies, it's because we no longer are sure that we love or are loved. In other words, the other person is not talking to us in our love language. Now we can express or receive all of these things, but usually one of these is the one that convinces us that we are loved. And if it isn't pressed, we will not feel love, no matter what else the other person does or says. In other words, if you talk to me in my language of love, then I will feel love. But if you're not talking to me in my language of love, even though you may be using the other languages, I'm not going to feel loved. Some examples of the language of love in action. For example, 
Let's say the wife's hot button for knowing that she is love is words. Let's say that's her hot button. Poems, love notes, saying sweet things, compliments on her looks, confessions of desire, the repeated words of love. That's, man, that is her hot button, okay? Now her husband, he grew up in a house where you know, his dad was the strong, silent type, no fancy words, no wasted words. And so the husband has grown up, like his dad, in this way. But he has learned to say, I love you through generous service. That's his language of love. He fixes her car, he takes care of the house, he does a lot of repair work for her elderly parents. You know what I'm saying? The guy, the guy is a, a true servant, that's his love language. Now what tends to happen here is that she won't feel loved because he's not expressing it in the way she needs it expressed. She needs words, not a new muffler on her car. You see what I'm saying? All right. She'll question his love and he'll point out all the things that he does for her, but she's not going to be satisfied because he's not speaking in her language of love. That's how affairs begin, believe it or not. Affairs begin when someone else discovers your hot button and starts pressing it. At the office, you know, that girl, this girl I'm describing, this wife, She's at the office and you know, the guy in the next cubicle, oh, you had your hair cut, it looks very nice. All proper and polite. He just, he's just, he just hit her button. I'm sure your husband's a very lucky guy. Hit the button again. Let's have, I'll sit with, you know, could, do you mind if I sit with you at break? Sure, I like, you know, yeah. Oh, is that a new dress? Yeah. That's how affairs begin. Now an interesting feature about this language of love business, people tend to receive their love messages in the same way that they give their love messages. So let's go back to our couple and see how this works. Remember, she receives love through words. So this is usually the way she gives it. And he receives, uh, he gives through action or service. So this is usually how he receives or recognizes love as well. So in a situation like this, she tells him she loves him and she gives him mushy birthday cards and she wants to talk about their relationship, but she's not interested in hanging out in the garage with him while he's working on his car. He needs to hear I love you by her involvement with him in his interests and his things. And in the end, he feels smothered by her words and she feels rejected by his silence. Now the sad thing about my little scenario here is that both people are trying to love, but each is missing the point and the sad thing is they don't realize it. You know, they end up in the counselor's office. You know, sometimes you see a perfect couple, they have a nice house, they have lovely children, uh, you know, there's enough money to you know, pay for whatever is needed, they're healthy, you know, it's like, well, what's your problem, you people? You, you've got everything, everything that anybody could want. Well, except one thing, the love that brought them together isn't there anymore. And believe me, all those other things aren't really worth it if you don't have the love. Now I've told you that some people want love, need love, desire to give love, but they fail in love because they can't seem to communicate it well. The answer is for them not to start loving, they're already trying to do that, nor is the answer to love differently. I don't think people can change their basic personality in order to accomplish this. For example, you know, touchy, feely people, they can't just change the way they are. It's not a superficial thing, it's who they are. That strong, silent guy there that, that loves through service, he's not going to become a poet. The answer, I believe, is to find ways to communicate about loving each other so we'll understand and hopefully better receive and give love that we have to give and need for ourselves. And the way to do this is to make communication that you do have more effective and more productive in the sense 
that you are consciously improving the communication bridge between you. In other words, you want the love to be better, then the communication about the love needs to get better. Okay? So there are ways to improve the communication between you and your spouse. Here are a couple of basic elements that will make you connect more effectively and efficiently at every level. First, be totally honest. Ouch, that hurts. Be totally honest. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. For communication to be productive, you need to be honest, even if it's risky sometimes. Many times we say what the other person wants to hear so we can get what we want. <laughs> we have this little bargain going. I'll tell you what you want to hear, you're going to give me what I want. Well, yeah, you get what you want, they hear what they want to hear, but you know what doesn't happen? The love doesn't happen. That's not how love operates. So the best example of this is when we compare the hierarchy of needs that men and women say that they need from each other. This survey shows what men and women acknowledge privately as their top five needs, but rarely acknowledge to each other for fear of ridicule or rejection. You understand what I'm saying? These are the five top needs that men and women privately say that they need to have. Like I need to have oxygen, you know? I mean, I'd like to have a new car, but what I really need is I need oxygen, you know, okay? I, I, I'd like to have a couple of new suits, but what I really need is water to drink, you know? So these are the five I need, not I wish I had. These are the five needs that men and women say they have. We'll start with, and this is under the heading of being honest. So we'll start with the women. Women say, number one, affection. Not necessarily sex, but romance, cuddling, holding, you know, a tactile, a tactile communication that I, I love you. Number two need, attention. The sharing of thoughts. Really listening with feedback. I mean, you're really hearing me. Put down the paper, put down the remote, put down the cell phone, turn the thing off. Can I talk for eight minutes without being interrupted by a child or by a phone call or by a, a tweet? Number three, trust. Her world, especially when there are children, is supported by him. She has to have confidence in him. She has to be able to trust him. Number four, this is what women say, not what I'm saying. Financial security, enough to live on and provide for the family, enough to give the children an advantage. Some people say, well, how much is enough? Well, enough so that we can give our children advantages. A better school if they need a better school, braces if they need braces, you know, advantages. And number five, what women say they need from their husbands, involvement getting involved in the home and in family matters, and truly providing leadership in the home. That's what women said, their five top needs. All right, we'll do men. Anybody want to guess what the first one is? <laughs> Ladies? Yes, sexual fulfillment. It is the number one need because that is the way that God created them. The natural production of seminal fluid in a man causes the constant need for gratification. It's not that he's a, he's a pig. It's not, oh, you, that's all you guys think about. It's the greatest single struggle each man must deal with in order to mature emotionally, socially, and spiritually. I mean, it is what it is, but it doesn't give him an excuse to sin, okay? But what I'm saying is God made him that way. Number one, need. Number two, a playmate. That's what he needs from his wife. Number two, imagine how deep we are. A playmate. <laughs> he wants his wife to be his buddy. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. I want you to watch this. Come here, come here, come here. watch this. <laughs> 
Okay, I, I, need, I just need you to hold the thing down. Wait a minute, I gotta get over and get that other strut there. Hang on a second. Uh, a tighter, hold it tighter. He, he wants a buddy. Number three, what does he need? He needs his wife to be attractive. A wife's looks and demeanor either build up a man's pride or bring it down. Number four, what does he say he needs? Domestic support, a quiet, clean, accepting home. And number five, admiration. He wants respect, he wants encouragement. In other words, honey, come and see. I just trimmed the hedge, come and see how straight it is. Oh, lovely. Sad but true, <laughs> what, <laughs> what the survey showed were things we kind of knew, right? We kind of, we kind of knew and expected, didn't we? That men, for example, are generally immature and self-centered. They need coaching, right? They want attention and gratification and they're not always willing to give in exchange for these things. And another thing we knew about women, women are more high-minded and they're usually more willing to invest more to make the marriage work. We knew that about women. I know that as a counselor, you know, 80, 80, 90 percent of the time the woman's the first one to come in. She'll drag that old boy in, you know what I'm saying? She'll rope him and get him in, you know, but usually she's the one that recognizes there's a problem. She wants to save that marriage. She's willing to first one to admit that there's something wrong and she'll go see the counselor and, and maybe that old boy a couple of weeks down the road, he'll finally you know, come on in. However, we also realize that women are, um, tend to ask for conflicting things. They want security and advantages for their children, which places a greater burden on the husband if he's the primary earner. But at the same time, they want him to be at home more, more involved, which requires time. Time that he needs to be at work, to make more money, to buy the things that she needs. You see, there's a conflict there. So sometimes women need to understand that they can't have it both ways. Can't have it both ways. If you want him home every night, all the time, right after work, da, 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 da. Well, then there is no overtime. There is no extra money. So we're going to have to forego that thing that you want. So in all of these things, we have to be honest with each other. If you're forgetting the point here uh, from some of the comedy, uh, the point we're making is we have to be honest with each other if we are to have productive communication. And productive communication is what we need in order to keep the, you know, the love alive in our, in our uh, marriages. Another thing that we need in productive communication. It has to be clear. For communication to be productive, it needs to be crystal clear. More arguments, divisions, and hurt feelings come from communication that is simply unclear than from intended insult. We don't intentionally you know, want to hurt the other person's feelings with our words. I mean, if we do, then you know, we, we owe an apology. A lot of times hurt happens because, you, what did I say? How many times do guys go around and say, what did I say? I, what did I, tell me what I said, right? So hearers need to reassure the speaker that he or she has truly been understood. Our words and actions need to convey what we mean. If what we're, if what we're doing means uh, I'm truly sorry and not just I'm tired of arguing. <laughs> There's a difference between I'm really sorry and I'm tired of arguing with you. Those are not the same thing, okay? Make sure the other person knows about it. And you know what, it's okay to say for tonight I'm just tired of arguing. We can continue this tomorrow, but I, I'm just afraid I'm just going to say something you know, that I don't really mean. And so could we just put a pause right here? I promise we'll pick it up tomorrow and we'll continue. So it's okay to be tired of arguing, but don't lie and say, I'm sorry, just to end the argument. 
Why? Because you're not going to resolve the argument. You're not going to resolve the problem. The love ain't going to be there for an insincere, I'm sorry. Practice good feedback methods. Say and do what you will, but always make sure through feedback that the other person is understanding your words and intention. You know, tell me what I just said. Our goal is to go beyond communication with the other person to communion or fellowship with the other person. Communion is reached when both people share the truth and reality of what is being communicated. I don't simply understand your words, I understand your feelings. I understand your feelings. Clear communication moves through three stages. Mirroring, which is, I've truly heard what has been said. That's mirroring. Validation, I see and understand your point of view, even if I don't agree with it, but I see it, I get it, I get where you're coming from. And then empathy, I confirm that your feelings are valid and true, even if I don't experience them as intensely or in the same way as you do, I acknowledge that this is what you're feeling. You're feeling sorrow and you have a right to feel sorrow. That's, that's empathy. And finally, for communion to be productive and effective, it has to be complete. We must tell the truth, we must express it clearly, and we must express all of it. Now some agree with this, but when there is a, an area which is taboo in a relationship where one partner refuses to discuss or share, a gradual closing down of communication begins. You know, when the other person says, don't go there, I don't let anybody go there. Nothing kills love more effectively than secrecy or lies because love cannot grow in the shadows. Secrecy breeds mistrust. There is no greater joy or protection than having a loving partner with whom there are no secrets nothing that can't be discussed. If we want to regain and renew love, we have to begin by reviewing our communication with our partners. All right, so I, uh, uh, we're going to quit there. I have here a productive communication worksheet. Homework. All right, here's the assignment. No kids, no phone, no computers, no TV. I know that's a task. Find a babysitter. So you can have an hour or two to talk. Discuss with your partner what you think your love language is and what theirs is. Fill out the productive communication worksheet and then discuss it with your spouse and then review some of the ideas and thoughts on the back. For men, you know, to-do list for men and a to-do list for women that helps keep that, you know, that flame alive. Now the productive communication worksheet might start a fight. So, because the first question is, list three things you like most and three things you dislike about your partner. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 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 hey, 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 hey. Man up, huh? Woman up. Uh, if, you can't, if you can't share that with your spouse, what's the point? The whole point is productive communication. We've talked about being honest, being clear, but it's also being kind. I can say there's something that you do that, that I don't like. I can, I can describe that and say that without intentionally hurting your feelings. Okay. There are easier questions as it goes on, but it starts with the hardest one, okay? All right, so I'll hand these out. You do these. Uh, you don't bring them back next week and share with the group. <laughs> I, I already know what I don't like about you, Corey. So. You're going to need more workspaces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm this was on the wife's side. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> Anyways, we'll do these and you can, you just keep them, all right? And we'll move on to another lesson next week. Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you very much.